Right, good afternoon, and it's uh, another Gear Guru on Keep Cardiff Live, and today uh, we have Mark Pont in with us. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon. Very good pleased day. to meet you. We, we, our paths have sort of crossed, but I don't think we've really formally met, but uh, I have heard of your music and your playing. Um, so the first question really today, before we get into all the gear, uh, you know, if you could tell us a little bit about Mark Ponting, you know, what, what do we expect from Mark Ponting? Um, well, I, I'm a Welsh blues rock musician. Uh, I play original music. I also do covers in the local bars when I uh, need some money. And uh, I've been a, what they call a journeyman musician for, for, cool. 30 years now, quite a long time. Grew up watching people in the Cardiff bars and learning how to play, people like Titch Willem and Glenn Knight and all those guys, and uh, got my own band together, and I've been doing it ever since, really. So uh, I'm a bit later in life coming to the original music thing, but uh, it's my main focus at the moment. So I've got my third album coming out now next year, hopefully, depending on COVID. But uh, yeah. That's, that's me, basically. Yeah, so, so, it sounds really interesting. Well, you know, you've you've you say you're journeyman. You've you've had a bit of a career. What I really like there is, as well as you mentioned, a couple of um, local musicians as influences. You know, uh, well, people that I know, and I'm sure a lot of other people will know. Uh, and it's interesting going to bars and uh, you know local bars and seeing them. Uh, yeah. It's great you reference them. Is there also like uh, other musicians? You know, um, who would be. Uh, more more signed or recorded artists that um, have influenced you as well? Well, obviously the big ones like Hendrix and uh, Clapton when he was with Cream and John Mayall and um, all the blues guys, B.B. King, Muddy Waters, Albert King, Albert Collins, all those guys. I like more contemporary sort of jazz blues guys like Robin Ford, Mike Landau, people like that. Doyle Bramhall is another one, you know. Um, when I started playing, the the fastest guitarist at the time, from a blues sense, was Stevie Ray Vaughan. So mm. I don't quite fit in with the current crop of, you know, hyper speed blues no. guys no. that play fast. But uh, um, I kind of missed out on that boat a little. But Stevie Ray Vaughan was probably the the, the sort of last big one. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody that plays music with with feel the heart and soul you know it doesn't have to be blues or blues rock it can be anything really as long as it's got honesty to it if you know what i mean it's uh, without being disrespectful as long as they're writing it and they mean what they're singing and playing you know it's uh, mm. comes across to me in uh, a stronger sense you know so you say uh, listening to some of your music as well do you say that there's kind of other influences maybe a bit of jazz and funk uh, chucked in there as well yeah 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 in fact the next album is I, I, I've been listening to a lot of late 60s, early 70s funk music. So uh, Sly Stone and um, Johnny Guitar Watson when he started off in his funk period. Uh, James Brown when he was moving away from the, the hits and getting more into the deeper into the funk, you know. Uh, Funkadelic, Parliament, that, that kind of stuff. And um, that's come through in the next album a lot, but it was starting to seep through in the second album. The first album was kind of like um, a demo compared to what's gone on since, you know. It's uh, It's been a progression, really. I, I'm lucky I don't have a label or anything like that telling me what to do, so I can uh, I can just um, develop on my own, if you know what I mean. And, yeah, definitely. Well, we can see there's lots of gear around you, and, uh, you know, I've been relishing this. Looking at the amplifiers and the guitars is just amazing. Uh, it's like you've got your own guitar shop there set up. Um, I, I think really uh, the, the best thing is, is just to allow you to tell us a little bit about um, the, the, the instruments and the amplifiers that you have there. Maybe some of your favorites, some of the ones you use on tour. I mean, if you can just go around and, and you know, I'll, I'll just uh, mention a few things if uh, yeah, sure. uh, whilst, whilst you're having a chat with us about it. So where do you start is the thing. There's so many. Uh... Well, let's start, let's start at the top, <laughs> show. My, uh, my favorite guitar and the guitar that I lasted after for a long time is this. This is a 1961 Stratocaster. It's um, all original, all original paint. Obviously, it's it's battered. Mm -hmm. It was a condition one. There's nowhere I could I, I could afford to to have it. But it's just it's it's an ash body and blonde, so it's a little bit different from the norm. They're usually older. But it's just, um, there is something they say about these old guitars, and 
I had to find out if it was true. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that it is. That there, there's another fifteen percent, say, on top from a custom shop. And if you're somebody like me that's been searching for the tone for thirty years, that fifteen percent means a lot, you know. So yeah. it's. Uh, I enjoy. I got some custom shop ones as well, and I enjoy those. But this one sees most of the recording. Mm-hmm. If I'm returning in the UK, I'll use this one. I don't take it abroad, but um, I'll play it in the UK. Um, the only trouble is, is I have to keep it on my back all the time because uh, it yeah. is quite valuable, even though it's battered. So if you ever see me play, you'll see uh, in between sets me sitting next to it, or after I finish, it'll be on, on my back in a case. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not surprised it, it, at that, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that that would be your number one go-to guitar now, yeah? Number one, yeah. This one is the... Most of my... Um, I didn't have this when I was doing my last two albums, but the new album is mostly this guitar. Right. As, as the Stratocaster tones on it. It's mostly this guitar. There's a couple of couple of other guitars here and there, but uh, I just found this one had a more authentic tone. Mm-hmm. But I like that era of music. I like the 60s, I like the 70s. So a lot sure. of that here... It's kind of like, I suppose it's a little nostalgic, but I want to get that tone. So I use yeah. the gear that's uh, in that, uh, you know, to get that tone. But it's, uh, yeah, it's it actually on the back. You can't really see it on the camera here, but um, there's two names scratched here and here. Right. Mick, Mick Logsdon and Brandon Logsdon. And when I got it, it was covered in nicotine. Right. So I'm guessing, I'm guessing probably... It was a father and son, and I'm guessing that one of them is not alive anymore because of the amount of nicotine that was on the guitar. Yeah, probably. Um, I, I expect the father handed it to the son, and the son didn't play it anymore. But uh, it 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 was it was a lot more. You can see it around here a little, where it's a little orange there. But it was all orange, so I used um, naphtha, lighter lighter fluid, just to just, you know just to remove the nicotine. Mm. Mm. So, because uh, I was playing it and it would come off on my arm, and yeah, I had yeah, it on it'd be nicotine. It was, it was disgusting, you know. Yeah, you can, still, you can still kind of see it's on the back here. Look, there's a bit there that I just left, and it's. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons why you know I was able to get the guitar because it is it's what they call a player grade, mm. even though it's all original. It's uh, it's not a it's not a museum piece, and if it hadn't had all those. Um, problems with it then uh it would have been out of my reach you know well i guess, I guess the nicotine side of it you know it shows it's had a life it's played lots of clubs and pubs you know i mean uh, right. i used to have um 335 and the binding on that had gone yellow and when you took it out the case even years afterwards you could still smell the nicotine on it you know so i i guess that's that's that is um part of the history um so would you say that that makes that guitar makes you play a little bit different have you is it affected the way you've played because you've got that now i think i think they use the word mojo mm. and um, this guitar has a mojo when you pick it up I, I suppose it's a psychological thing you're probably thinking this guitar is coming up 60 years old and what did it do before i had it and who played it before i had it exactly it's got, it's got, yeah. a, it's got a history that you don't know about and it will have a history it will outlive me you know so it's it's kind of like it's got it's got a heart and soul and when you pick it up it makes you respect it mm. you know you, you think am i good enough to play this instrument that's the first thing that goes through my mind am i doing this instrument justice you know and uh, so yeah it's 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 not an easy guitar to play it's um i've had it refretted because it was really it had a couple of refrets and the, and the one i when I had it, the frets were awful on it, but um, you have to fight these old guitars. A little, the action's a little high. I use heavy gauge strings, so you know it's not. If I hand this guitar to other people, yeah. Clint Knight played this a few times, and he's uh, he's he's moaned a little because he uses lighter strings, and he's right. uh, you can't tell though when Glenn's playing it. He looks like he's been playing it all his life, but uh, yeah, yeah. But it's um, it's my favourite one. You know, it's getting to the point. Like I said, I can't take it. I don't want to take it on airplanes or anything like that. I've got, no. I'll show you uh, some other guitars that I use when I do European dates. But yeah, this is, uh, this is my favorite. Each, all my guitars are always tuned down half a step as well. So okay. you get that classic Hendrix kind of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's that one. Okay. 
And uh, we've got another one here now. This is a this is a 1965 Stratocaster. Okay. And um, this is all original, and it's got a it's got a more of a rocky tone to that to the 61. It's a bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, I wanted this because it's still pre CBS. But it's okay. an affordable, it's an it's a affordable PC at CBS. It's an L series, early '65. So the transition paint here, the the um, what they call a clown burst. Right. CBS were doing. They were using less figured woods, so the older is not got a, a, a as figured a grain in it. And then the the burst changed over the years to be this this signature '65 era, late '64 to through '66. This kind of burst. And then you've got the transition logo at the top there. Right, yeah. With a sign that it was, you know, the ones after this late 65, then they went to the big headstock. The big headstock, yeah. Yeah, so it's, this, is a, this is another, you know, I use this guitar a lot. In fact, um, uh, the festival is not, not this year, last year, obviously, when we were playing, I would, I would use this a lot in the festivals because it was, uh, for some reason, it would cut through a little more. Right. And... Uh, I had some tuning issues with that one with a nut, so I was using this one a lot. So there's videos of me online more playing this one than there is uh, the 61. But uh, it's got a signature. Someone put a guitar strap in the case, so these marks are here because they left the case and they closed. Oh it. right, yeah, okay. So again, it makes it a player grade. You know, it's affordable, and it's uh, it's something that you don't mind if it gets a little nick. You're not going to panic about losing thousands of pounds because of that little neck you know it's, yeah uh, but it's a great guitar i love it it's one of the ones will will be there on my desk bed if you know what i mean it's not going anywhere yeah it's, it's a, be light as well they're quite light you know yeah it's another quality guitar i mean it's a lovely strat yeah, yeah. again i've had it refretted um when i had it the frets were really really low and it had flat one strings on it right so okay it hadn't, it hadn't been used for a number of years this pot, I have to constantly lubricate the pot because it, it, if I don't do it, I can't, I can't play. It's just, it's just yeah. Know, so I might have to replace the volume pot on it, but uh, it's great. But that's all, that's all part of having something vintage, really, isn't it? You know, it's going to come with a bit of character and it's, uh, that's right. yeah. yeah. Such with certain things, yeah. So when I, when I go, when I go abroad, yeah, use this is a, a guitar made by a Welshman. This is a, a Zero One Guitars. Uh, it's a 57 style Strat. The guy's name is Jeff Beer, and he lives in Pencada. So it's uh, Carmarthenshire. Uh -huh. And he, he built me this, and I said I wanted a, a, a 50 style Stratocaster. And, and it's amazing. It's really amazing. It's, it, it's like I said, there's a 15% with the, the old ones, but Mm. If I'm on the road um, playing in Europe and, and I can't take my guitar on the plane, then I don't want to put the, the old ones in the, in the hole. Sure. I still don't want to lose this one, but it's, you know, it's not as valuable. And I've got, I've got three of his strats and I've got two mm. of his Telecasters so that I can, you know, use these. Sure. Uh, when when I can't use my old ones, you know. Just sort, of, uh, just sort of interest, but what, what pickups were, would be in... Uh, that guitar. Well, these are, I think these are Z3s. Jeff calls them. He makes his own pickups. He, well, he makes his own, right? Hand wound, I, I imagine. Yeah, there's yeah. Z1s and Z3s. I'm not sure which one is the 50s and which one is the 60s, but these mm. are they're low output. They they're, they're modelled after 50s pickups. Yeah, sure. He even went so far as to get the 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 Bakelite. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, plastics as well, which they 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 cracked and all that kind of stuff, you know. Mm. And the only thing I did was I took the finish off the back of the neck. Sure. To make it feel like the old ones a bit. And uh, it hasn't quite darkened yet. And they say put vinegar on it and stuff, but I don't want to smell of vinegar. When I <laughs> have no. no, that's so not a good one. That comes with me when I uh, do flying dates. Uh -huh. Or if I'm playing a dodgy bar and I don't want to take the <laughs> old ones. Then we've got, um, I like tallies as well. Uh -huh. This is a... 63 Telecaster, all original. I uh, wanted this because of Robin Ford, because he's got a yeah. 1960. And uh, again, it was it's a player's grade. It's, the wear was mostly on it when I had it. 
and um, it's been refretted, you know. It's got a little microphonic pick up there, you know, you have to watch with fuzz pedals, things like that. Mm. But it's got it's got an amazing sound. It's got this unique tone to it. I had um I used to have a 56 telly and I sold that because I thought I've got this one. I don't think I can top this one, you know, this is, yeah. this is a guitar. And uh, I'm not I'm, I'm getting I played strats for so long that I'm not used to playing Telecasters live because of the the sharpness. Yeah. So I played them for a song or two, and then I'd put them on the stand. But in the studio, I use them a lot, especially mm. I, want, I want that that bridge pickup sound that they have, or the middle selection, you know, the two pickups together, because you can't get that on a Strat. It's, no. Uh, it, it's, but, an ama- it's an amazing guitar, the Telecast. I mean, you, you think they pretty much got that right, right in the beginning, didn't they, really? Yeah. The design yeah. and the sound yeah. of it. It's, it's great. I can play this. I play this guitar every single day. Mm. And I play it unplugged and I plug it in and it's something about it, you know, just something that uh, it's a great guitar. And I'm very lucky to have it. This is probably the most valuable guitar I own as well because they, they didn't make a great deal of the blonde tellies. You know, they made, they, you see them around, but there's not, there's not hundreds and hundreds of them like no. your son telly, you know, so... Mm. And telecasters in the, in the sixties, they want they didn't make as many as they were making. So, yeah, that's that one. So that's another, just, another fantastic guitar. And we have another one here, which is uh, another sixty three, but this has been refinished. Uh-huh. So this was a this was a cheaper guitar, but I wanted it because of Muddy Waters' guitar. Right. He's got. Uh, I think his was a 60, I think, or maybe even earlier. But it was it was a Dakota Red or Fiesta Red uh, mm. Tally Tally. And he had he famously had the Fender amp knobs here, which I haven't done, but uh, no. uh again it's a it's a beautiful sounding guitar. This bridge pickup's been rewound, uh-huh. it's finished, but everything else is original. The neck's a little bigger than the other one. And um, I've had it refretted, and the guy that refret, refrets all my guitars wanted to buy it off me, so this must they must have had uh, yeah something special about it. Another another great telly, you know. And again, it's it's a cheaper cheaper option, so I can use this and not be as worried about it, you know. Mm. And it's, really uh, cool Telecaster, great color. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, my drummer doesn't like red guitars, so he's whenever I put it on, he frowns. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's that one okay then we have one more tally this is uh, an interesting one it's a 1967 right so you've got the the more later 60s the later logo. logo yeah this is a smuggler's tally so okay. basically under here is all hollow right and if i put the scratch plate off well at the time fender were buying ash and it was quite heavy uh-huh. so to to make some weight relief they routed out all under here and they call it a smuggler's tally because back in the day you could put drugs or anything <laughs> and, and not be found out you know yeah but this is uh this has got a, again and it's it's a different sound to the other two mm-hmm. and it's got a, quite a flamey neck on it as well i don't know if you can see that in the light there yeah um it's a clive brown refinish now clive brown's one of the renowned uh finishes in the uk for doing vintage style finishes so it was originally blonde and he's put it back to blonde he's done a great job i mean the, yeah on the back there Amazing. Sure it's uh it doesn't look like it's been refinished you know i've had a few problems with the electrics and this i've had to change the switch and it's still uh it's a bit buzzy here and there when i touch the knobs but you know it, it came up it was available and affordable and it's it's a, it's a vintage guitar it's, it's not a, it's not a pre-cbs but it's uh, it's a vintage it's now been refinished with the nitro paint so it's uh, better than it would have been you know and mm. they, they all these the last of the good ones the last of the 67 era they went very poly thick paint after that and yeah uh, even even though still good guitars but you know it's uh, do you think uh, the fact that it's a routed up body as well? Do you think that's that gives it a different sound, a different feel? Definitely, yeah, definitely. Mm. It's um, I can't really describe the sound. I mean, the red tally has probably got the most aggressive sound. The 
other blonde telly is quite a smooth sounding telecaster but it's got that bark and this one's got a signature sound again it, it, those later 60s pickups are, are a lot different you know I'll, I'll use this guitar in the studio a lot i'll have the three tellies and i'll try each one to see which one i prefer for for the song and this will sure. get a look if it's uh, if it just suits the song better and i do pick this one out on the roads um because it's not it's, it's nowhere near as valuable as the other ones you know it's so yeah. uh, nice to use uh an authentic kind of vintage sort of telly you know so there's that one tell me and tell me if i'm showing <laughs> It's just like a never-ending list of guitars. It's great. Well, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only going to show a couple more because I've actually got 38. We won't be here. Oh, <laughs> I think it'll be a long, long interview. Yeah. I don't. I, I'm not known as a Gibson player, but I have one nice Les Paul. I've got a couple of SGs. Mm -hmm. This is an R eight, R nine. Sorry, I think it's 2008. I think, and it's it's in immaculate condition. It's it's been slightly factory aged. Mm. Well, I wanted one good Les Paul, you know. It's uh, it's got it's got that tone. It's got the uh, the classic Gibson Les Paul tone. Uh, what type of neck is it is uh, on that? It's quite a chunky '59 yeah. neck, and uh, it's it's great, you know. I I don't I collect if, if I suppose I collect Fender guitars, but Gibson guitars I have a few select ones. Uh, I'm not used to the. Um, on the SG, for example, it will do that when you're, and it's sort of you're playing it and it's out there. Kind of, so I'm not used to that. Mm. And the one reason I don't play Gibson's live much is because I use fuzz pedals, so I'm constantly doing that with the volume control on the strap, which is here. But of course, here you've got to actually move down there to do it, and I do it like that. Yeah. And of course, this is up here, whereas it's just there with, with, on a strap. So I, I tend to use this in the studio more than anything else. Right. And uh, if I want a big riff, you know, through one of these uh, Marshalls. Yeah, the power, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's a classic sound, you know. And uh, I love it. I don't think I'll ever buy another Les Paul, but I, I love it. You wouldn't need to. It's lovely. That's it. Then um, for acoustics, this is my... Um, 1964 Epiphone Frontier. Fantastic. Um, people think uh, Epiphone are budget guitars. What they don't realise is uh, pre-1970, they were owned by Gibson, I think, from 1957 to 1970. Yeah, that's true. So they were made in the same factory in the Kalamazoo, mm -hmm. same as the Gibson guitars. And if you've got um, the Frontier... I think was the Epiphone version of the Hummingbird or the Epiphone version of the Dove, you know, that they had for every Gibson Dove, you had an Epiphone sort of version yeah, as well. That's right. Um, uh, John Lennon or, or McCartney, one of the Beatles like these, Noel Gallagher played, uh, as you've seen on the video, one of these. And I just, I just liked it because it's got the, the longer scale length. It's got the 25 mm. and three quarter, whatever it is, scale length. Is. So it's, it's uh, it's easier in that respect. It's got the, the adjustable bridge here, you know, and it's got a lovely it's been out of tune. It's, it, it's a lovely recording guitar, you know. It's uh, mm. I've got a Martin, which I find Martins can be a little boomy when you're recording, unless you've got a good one. Mm. I've got, I've got a, um, I've got a I can't remember what's called now, but it's it's one of the ones which is stage ready. It's about a fifteen hundred pound Martin. Mm. And it's great, but this this just trumps it, you know. When it's got new, fresh strings on, it just really resonates. I mean, the strings are a bit old now, but it's on this one. But uh, but it was it was immaculate until my 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 wife dropped something there. And oh dear, neck and uh, yeah. So she's she's been made to feel guilty every day. <laughs> but it's a great guitar. This is what I use for recording any acoustic parts, and um, a lot of people don't like the. The cowboy kind mm. of look but i do i like it's it's um it's got a uniqueness to it it's a maple back i think it's a maple top and maple back so it's got a, a very unique sound and i'm very lucky to have it yeah and it actually, um on the top here there's a little sticker and it was sold originally at wilkes music stores in swansea right so exactly 
sold in Swansea and then I ended up bringing it back to Swansea. So that yeah, was quite, brilliant. Uh, quite poignant, you know. So there's that one. Well, like you say, I mean, uh, so synonymous with a lot of those early 60s bands and, the, you know, the Beatles, this f first one that springs to mind. But yeah, I mean, you've only got to look at all, all those photographs of that era and so many great songs written on Epiphones, you know, and played on Epiphones. Well, they're, they're making a comeback now. They've actually, um, the casino's been around for a while as, as a, as a uh, since Gary Clark Jr. started using the more yeah. modern casinos. But they've actually revitalized the coronet as well, I think. Hmm. Which is uh, Steve Marriott that style guitar, you know the the uh, and um, but also the vintage ones are going are going skyrocketing. I mean, I I doubled my money on that that Epiphone within yeah. a year. You know, people started to to realize how good they are, hmm. and they were what they call sleeper guitars. People just they've gone under the radar. You know, the same uh, with um, some of the amps I've got. They, they they sort of floated under the radar, and now people are starting to find out. But they are actually worth money, you know. Yeah, so. definitely. I mean, I, I found that um, you know, the quality definitely improved, you know, from one mm. one of us sort of selling the guitars, and uh, the the quality control was really good. Whereas uh, there was a phase where Gibson let it slip a bit, you know, and uh, they weren't producing their best, perhaps. But Epiphone were consistent, and it, it, they started to build up, you know, a bit of a reputation. And it's one of those things as well. I think, you know, if you've got a basically good guitar like an Epiphone, you can always upgrade the pickups or change them around to how you want them as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you can you can yeah. have a really good guitar. Yeah, that's right. You don't have to spend vintage money to get a good guitar. You, know? you don't have to. If you can't, if you can't afford it, you know, uh, it's it's an alternative. I mean, this, um, this strap here, I actually bought this from your competitor. I bought this in Gamlin's. In 1993, it's a 1989 vintage reissue, mm -hmm. and all this wear is done was done by me. This used to see every single gig I did in the Royal Oak and Broadway and Cardiff, and yeah, played there three, three, four times a month for mm -hmm. 15 years. So this has been refretted. It's it's been dropped. It's been bashed. The the pick card pick card actually got broken, so I put a green pick card on it. I mean, I pick it up now and and. Compared to the vintage, it's all sharp on the edges and it's yeah. the dots are in the wrong place and all that. But this guitar was all I owned back then. Hmm. So it was literally this was this was my life, you know. Yeah. I, I'd never get rid of it. It's um every nick dent has been at a gig or at a rehearsal that I did, you know. Yeah. And it's it's worthless, you know, it's not worth anything to anybody, but to me, it's uh, you know. I never, never get rid of it. You know, it's been your companion in all those gigs. Yeah, I totally get that. I think a lot of guitarists would. It's um, it's not only the companion in the gigs, all the relationship breakdowns and all yeah. that. <laughs> all the I play, I History, play my own guitar, you know. Yeah. And it's the survivor, you know. It's I don't uh, tonally, it's not as good as the the vintage ones, and it's not as good as the custom shop ones. But when you're starting out. Mm. To own an American Strat was a dream, you know. Mm. And my grandmother, God bless her, she passed away this year, but she she actually lent me the money for this. It was six hundred and thirty pound, I think, at the time. And she said, "You must pay me back, mind." And I said, "Yeah, well." well. So anyway, six months later, I was struggling to pay her back. I don't think I'd given her more than ten pound. So she said, "Don't worry about it." So she she bought me this. She started me off on the uh, on the journey and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all those old pictures of me in the Royal Oak, that's that's me playing this guitar, you know. Uh, that's a great story as well. Yeah, so, so I've got, uh, I'll show you one more guitar, actually. Okay, yeah. Because we've got so many amps and effects to go through as well. This is going to be... Uh, that's right. Gonna be good. So this is an SG, yeah? This is an SG custom with the three pickups. Mm -hmm. And um, I always wanted one of these because of Hendrix. Hendrix had one on the... Dick Cavett show, but yeah. his was a late sixties one with the silver hardware. Yeah, so it's it's a nineteen ninety nine VOS um, custom shop or whatever they are uh, SG. It's a nice guitar, but I didn't realise that a lot of people have told me since that this pickup is just rubbish. You know, they this awful sound, mm. and it gets in the way when you're playing. It's in the way, you know, because I've got a, a sixty one reissue that I use as well, but this is just drives me mad. I'm going to have to really put it all the way down. You know, I never use that position at all. It just sounds awful. 
but it's it's nice that the only thing like i said with sgs they they kind of do that you know? it's they the do balance yeah. yeah yeah so uh again i don't i i used one life for a while but i just got sick of that and doing mm. all that and also i'm always afraid it's going to pop off there and uh, yeah and then these these are just going to snap you know so there's that one as well but uh let's put that over there okay amplifiers don't worry i'm not going to show you all the amplifiers i've got more <laughs> stars but i've got my cooling ring i don't know if you can see this here yeah yeah this is a two rock classic reverb signature okay and that's a two rock two by 12 cab mm -hmm. so this this setup here is what i take on the road if i'm doing the festivals or, or bigger gigs okay um, i used to just take their down Mm -hmm. but the sound engineers have got quite strict so now i've got this little box here this ox box is called which it acts as an attenuator right so i can use it to keep it quieter mm -hmm. but also i can use it at home and have it going straight into the um, interface that i've got with this side of it but this is this is uh i mean i, I own a lot of vintage amps and this is right up there with all of them you know so uh, what sort of wattage is that mark well, it's a switchable 50 to 100 watt. You can either have it 50 okay. or 100 watts, you know? Yeah. Um, before I bought this, it was hard to use anywhere. I, I would use it with a 1 by 12 cab mm. in some places, but, you know, it's... I don't play... I mean, I'm not I'm not a known artist or anything, so I, I don't get massive arenas or anything to play in. It's only when I do the festivals, we get the bigger stages that I can use a 2 by 12. Yeah. Nowadays... It's all, you know, as quiet as you can be. So I've got another rig I'll show you now for that. But um, yeah. I, I think back to when I used to play in the Royal Oak, I would go there to watch Titch play on a Thursday and he'd have, he'd have a four by 12. Then I'd see Glyn playing on a Sunday and Glyn would have dual showmans with, with two two by 12s. Yeah. And then I'd go there then and play with my four by 12. And nobody used to say we were too loud. Nobody said no. anything. And it wasn't a very big room either, was it? Really, you know. Exactly. exactly. So I don't know what it was. Maybe everyone was just deaf, or, or uh, <laughs> nobody cared, you know. So, yeah. but it suddenly changed uh, in the in the the sort of first first decade of the of the two thousands. Mm. PA's caught up a bit, you know. I remember just doing a gig with Albert Lee, and uh, I pushed my four by twelve on stage, and the sound engineer just went, "No, it's just no." Didn't even wait till I plugged it in. So I had to turn it round, and then the, the speakers were facing the back of the wall. Yeah. And he still didn't mic it up. No. And I wasn't, wasn't loud, but it was just he couldn't blend it in with the singer and all this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, because a lot of people know a lot of the big acts have stuff off stage, don't they? They have cabs off stage yeah. mic'd and yeah. stuff like that. You know, it seems to have changed a lot, as you say, certainly in the last couple of decades. Yeah. I mean, all this gear behind me here, it used to be my road gear, these, you know, but now uh, it just gets used in the studio. Mm -hmm. This is the first um, vintage amp I own. This is a 69 um, Super Bass, and it's still got the plexi panel on it. Right. There's a 1975 Super Bass there, which I use back up. And then um, I was playing in a bar in Barry, and this fella came in with this, and he said, you're going to like this, it's for sale. And it's a PA20, it's a 20 watt Marshall, 1972. Mm -hmm. And um, he wanted fifteen hundred pound. I said, I, I haven't got fifteen hundred pound. So every few months, I was phoning him up and I was offering him seven hundred and fifty pound, which is all I had. Seven hundred fifty pound. Nope, nope, nope. Then as he got nearer to Christmas, he went, okay then. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it for seven hundred and fifty pound. And mm -hmm. uh, but only this is a, a Metropolis. Basically, I, I I got that's a hand wired super lead, mm -hmm. the Vichy one. But I never had a, a an authentic super lead. They're all super bases, you know. Yeah. So this does a forty five one hundred, and it does a super lead. You've got a little uh, switch there to change it. Switch it around, yeah. So I ordered that from America because I wanted the Jimmy plays Monterey kind of sound, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. that does a pretty good job, you know. Then I've got the two four by twelves that are just gathering dust now there, and uh, with uh, I use them in the studio, but even in the studio they're this podcast but we only mic up one speaker really so yeah i mean i think uh, you, you touched on something there i mean a, a lot of the martial amps were modified in some way i mean I, I, I believe i'm right in saying that hendrix certainly played around with things like that as well uh i mean yeah. 
uh, just for people who may not know about them, I mean, uh, the heads you've got there, who who would you say they're sort of, sort of synonymous with? You know, you mentioned Jimmy well, Page. This super base, the super bases are Band of Gypsies, Hendrix, yeah, or Kossoff, mm -hmm. and um, I think Dwayne Allman, but I think he went on to a, a, a 50 watt Marshall then. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's there's not a great deal of difference between the super no. and super base. There there is a a, a, a travel difference, you know. Obviously, it's, a, it's I think it's a one or two caps. That's all it is. But the reason I wanted this was because Doyle Bramhall brought an album out called Welcome, right, uh, in the early 2000, 2001. and that um, sound on there, he actually used the super bass. Anyway, so that's my touring rig. Yeah. That's a modern amp. You know, they, they've only just been out about three years. Mm. Again, I picked that up on a, in, a, in a trade because I couldn't afford a brand new and they're about £4,000. But I got it in a trade. So I'll go to the um, iPhone now. Okay. Is it still on the screen? Yeah, yeah, we go. we got a nice clear picture there. It's moving Can around a bit. Here? Wow. Now, this is this is my my what I call my small gig rig. Uh-huh. The 66 friend of Princeton. Right, brilliant. And this is a 58 Tweed Deluxe. Yeah. And I'll either use them with a 1x12 cab on their own, or I'll use them running into this THD cab down here, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, it's, the speakers are separate on it. You know, they, they work independently of each other. So mm -hmm. I've got this going into one and that going into the other. And this sees the most of my gigs because it's so... Quiet. It's only a lot of twelve or fifteen watt amp. Yeah, I use this in a, in a lot of the clubs and the bars because mm. it's just enough volume. You know, that's probably the best amp I own in, to in tone wise. I and be because of the, the low wattage as well, when you turn them really up, they really start to sing, don't yeah, they? Yeah, I mean, it's just it just it's just got enough headroom mm. to where I can do um, I can play and it's not feel like it's it's getting compressed. You know, mm. yeah, it's just there because I've got I've got. You know, these several of these amps back here, they're the more powerful blackface um, fenders, but yeah. they tend to be still too loud, you know. So if I'm doing a little club, I mean, the last time I was on tour was uh, 2019 because of COVID, but right. so I took the, the two rock there and I took that mm -hmm. and I used the Princeton all the time. But the sound engineers would just say, look, I can't cope with the two rock. So yeah. I go that and it, I was just as happy playing that to uh, Princeton as I was the two rock. Yeah, it, um, it has something about it. Yeah, I, I, lo I love the small valve amps, you know, the, the 15 watts, yeah, the 20, yeah. 25 watts. It's just something really special about them when you crank them up as well. Yeah, it's, it's my favorite amp. I've got to be honest, it's really, uh, you know, it's something special. In fact, I'm looking for another one. The Tweed Deluxe over there, mm -hmm. um is another classic amp, but it's a lot quieter for some reason than the the, the Princeton. Princeton, and yeah. I, I, even though it's not supposed to be, it's uh, it's serviced. There's nothing wrong with it, but I think that I mean it, it kind of like fills the sound out a little bit more mm -hmm. when I use two of them. But um, it's a recording amp now. That I mean that's a 1958 Tweed Deluxe. You know, you can't really take that out on the road no, anymore. No, it is that classic, that Eagles. Um, you know, Joe Walsh. In fact, it's a song on my, my next album, which I kind of tried to ape Joe Walsh. And I used that. That's the combination of amps I used for that was those two together with uh -huh. no pack. Just turn them up, you know. And uh, yeah, it's a great amp. I really, really like it. Uh, is that, uh, that's voltage converters. Eh? Is he, are they yeah, 110? Yeah. 110 volt. I was going to turn it on for you, but unfortunately, I remembered um, the last time I used that THD. Uh, cab was in the Earl Hague uh, in November 2019 and we had a multi-band situation and there's 65 watt speakers in there they're scumbag speakers where's my scumbag these uh, these things here I don't think you can see that yeah in uh, Guy in America makes the pre-roller style Celestian okay um, the speakers I use this is an M75 it's a basically a high powered greenback right and i use them because you can get a hundred watt greenback which you couldn't get from celestian right but in the thd they're only 65 watts 
And of course, there's only one on at a time. So I lent my camp to a guitar player with a 100 watt Marshall head. Oh, right. OK. So one of the speakers is actually blown. I tried it earlier and it's, it's blown. So I can't oh, that's really a shame. turn them on today. But well, like I said, I'll send you some footage anyway. and you can. Uh, yeah, it'd be, be great to, to have some plain footage that. as well. I've got a I've got a Welsh um, pier as well. Look, remember those mango? Mango, duo? yeah, yeah, I remember those, yeah. Mango oh. duo. That's like a a Vox. Mm -hmm. I've got a Vox AC30 somewhere as well, which is really nice. And uh, but yeah, I just got a I got a passion for amplifiers, you know. Yeah, you can see that. I mean, and and, and you know it's, the quality of them as well. You know the selection you've got there is fantastic. I could work my way up, but I started off again. I, I had a. Um, an H&H &H 100 watt uh, combo was my I, gig. I had one of them as well, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I traded that for a 30 watt Marshall combo. And then a friend of mine, I went to Leeds Music College and uh, a friend of mine up there knew a guy that was playing in a band called Batfish. And Batfish were being produced by Brian May. Right. So he said, he's selling his amp. We should go down to the studio and, and meet him and you can talk to him. It's a JCM 800, you know? Yeah. So I thought, I'm going to meet Brian May. So bizarrely, uh, the guy from Batfish said, look, you can come to come to see us when we're on dinner break and we'll be in the cafe in the Marion Centre in Leeds. So we went to this um, this greasy spoon and there's Brian May. He sits at the <laughs> table with this this band that he's producing mm. and, and he looked like, you know, the hair and everything was, you know, you, you didn't have curlers in or anything. You had all the hair all done. Yeah. So that's how I met Brian May. He was sat at this having a cup of tea. In a with greasy him. spoon. Yeah. yeah. So I, I bought that. The JCM 800 then was my amp I used for, whew, gotta be 15 years, something like that. I actually mm. had two of them. Mm. And I sold those for, I swapped them for a Fender rig. I had a Fender Twin reissue. And I had a Bassman reissue, which I still got down there. And there's a Bassman down there. Right. And I put those together. So again, stupidly loud when you think about it. Queen mm. Anna bass man. Um, then I got into um, the Marshalls again, the old Marshalls. Mm. Started collecting the vintage amps then. I got rid of all the reissues apart from the bass man. Mm. Just worked my way up to, uh, to get in the vintage ones. And things like this here, this, um, this bandmaster, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, that, brilliant. Uh, that cost me 25 quid. Wow. It, That's it, a wasn't it wasn't working, and I bid for it on eBay, mm. and it just said Fender Amp. It didn't say Fender Bandmaster. Mm. A guy in um, Chippenham, I think it was, and uh, he was emigrating to Saudi Arabia, I think he said, and uh, I went up, I won the auction for 25 quid, and he was. He said, I'm not, I'm not posting it. You'll have to come and get it. Yeah. So add a, say I add 80 quid on the fuel, but I drove up there and uh, I got that for 25 quid. So yeah. there, there, there are bargains still. Real bargain. Had. Yeah. You've got to look around, haven't you? But yeah, you're right. Exactly. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot to people don't know. Those bandmasters are, are brilliant amps and you mm. can still get them for under a grand. Mm. And they're, they're the same circuit really as, as the deluxes, as the, uh, the supers, they just got different output transformers in them. So it's uh, less of an output. I think they're 40 watt, I think, the Bandmaster. Yeah. But they've got that black face sound. Mm, that's right. And you can pick them up cheaper than you can a, a deluxe reverb reissue. You know, you can get an original, that's a 65. You can get them for 600, 650, 700 pounds, even now, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think on eBay at the moment, there's a, uh, one of those and a cab for 1,200 quid, and it's the original mm. cab. Yeah, it's so, a good bit of advice if you're looking for something vintage to get that sound. Well, I, I actually, there's a friend of mine um, called uh, Joe Pearson. He plays in a band called Five Points Gang. And um, he's from Cowbridge, which is where I'm from originally. And he contacted me asking my advice. And I told him to get a bandmaster. Mm. And found one for about £650 recently. And he absolutely loves it. And I'm trying to convince my other mates from down here, uh, George Jones, Mickey Jones's son, you know, Mickey Jones from that. I'm trying to convince him. He's like, I want a vintage sound. I said, just get a bandmaster. Yeah, bandmaster. He's he's saying, oh, I can't. You know, I I, I want to get a I want to get a such and such reissue. I said, no, get a bandmaster. You know. Yeah. And what people don't realize is all these old amps. They they're all you know they're all hand wired. So if a component goes wrong, 
it really easy to fix. Yeah. Because you just unsold that component. There's no tracer boards. There's no PC boards. No. You know, the um, the transformers, the transformers in them are really resilient. For example, those that Bandmaster is four ohm, but you can run it on eight ohm. Mm -hmm. and it, it will just run like that all the time, you know. Yeah, yeah. They, they go, they go forever. You know, I haven't had a, I've never had a Fender transformer go on me. I've never had a Marshall transformer either. But no, they're um, solid. Yeah, and if they do, you you can. There's there's great companies like Mercury Magnetics that uh, yeah. you can get home clone transformers. They just sound so much better. I've got a, a delete a deluxe reverb here. This um, that's that's a sixty four custom hand wired one. Right down here is is a clone that one at the bottom that was made by um a guy called eli abbott and george jones actually bought that clone and he, he didn't like it because it wasn't loud enough for him right and, and i suppose he does play with bob richards on the drums so i suppose it's, you've got to got to have a bit of oomph yeah bob, bob drummer uh, i sent it in to have it service when i bought it from george and that cost me 500 quid, whereas a deluxe reverb reissue would have been, what, 1,200, I think. Mm. And it, as it happens, there was a, del a deluxe reverb reissue in my Amtex um, workshop at the same time. And the guy that owned that turned up to pick his reissue up and said, what's that one there? And they plugged them in together, and it was like night and day. The guy yeah. was me up, wanted, me, wanted to buy mine off me. And, like, you know... The, 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 there is a difference the hand the, the hand wired ones there is a difference mm. definitely and those old amps they just, they just keep on going you know they keep on going and going there's some uh, great great advice you know if somebody's looking around you know uh, you say you still get these bargains on on eBay there's mm. definitely definitely worth checking out and it's, it's one of those things the valves are obtainable now and like you say you know the, the parts are obtainable um, yeah. you know well, if you, you know, if you get it if you've got a good tech who can look after them for you well, I'd recommend um, South Wales um, tech, uh, Anthony Matthews, who runs tunes yeah. in uh, Hengoid. And he's 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 not a he's not a, a boastful man, but he he does all Jimmy Page and stuff. He's I I know his reputation because I know um, uh, some friends of mine who are very big Jimmy Page fans, and uh, I know he's worked on Jimmy Page's amplifiers. Yeah. Well, about, about a year ago, I, I was up there, he was fixing one of my amps, and he said, uh, do me a favour, Mark. He said, you like what? You like uh, wah pedals, don't you? He said, try them for me. So you had three wah pedals set up. So I tried them, and I tried the middle one, and I tried the, the other one, and he said, which one's the best? I said, the middle one. He said, yeah, Jimmy thinks so as well. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a great story for the pub, that one, isn't it? Yeah. I chose Jimmy Page as well. Well, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> that's nice. pretty which moves us on nicely to the effects side of things. I can see you've got a, a we've, we, we saw some of the pedals that are up uh, on your other amps, but this is your main uh, effects this board, I main, guess. Uh, the main touring board. Yeah. You see it all there with the phone there. You yeah, see I can it? see that clearly. Yeah, yeah. So I'll go down and, and, and show. So okay. basically the, the signal goes in here, guitar goes in here. This is a, a so Delta, a delta vibe. vibe, yeah. This is a friend of mine started building pedals. Now I, I own an original Univibe and um, I'm a bit of a Jimmy FX freak. So I've got several of vibes, several fuzzes, several wars. So he borrowed my Univibe and he made a copy of it. And it's, it's brilliant. I actually got two, I've got one up here as well on this board too. But uh -huh. um, if anybody wants an authentic Univibe, the Delta Sound okay. Electronics, I, totally recommend those glenn oh. knight approved as well glenn knight loves them too where, where could you get that you can uh... uh if you go on facebook or if you he's got a website delta sound electronics delta sound electronics okay he's actually coming out with a deluxe version mm -hmm. but this was his first pedal i mean in fact the one there the black one mm -hmm. is a prototype they actually look like that with the uh right i get you swirl, you know right um He's actually coming up with a deluxe version because at the moment you can't plug an expression pedal into it to do the speed, but he's bringing out another version now within the next 12 months where you can use the speed controller, you know? Okay. It's, it's got that Hendrix tone. In fact, I was playing along the other day during the lockdown. What's kept me sane is um, 
I've sort of reverted back to when I was learning guitar and I've gone back and listened to all the yeah. pre Hendrix again. Yeah. I was playing along with the Hendrix bootleg and he was doing Hey Baby. And I was playing Hey Baby with that. And I thought, my God, you can't tell the difference. Right. The difference. Amazing. There's actually a comparison video that James shot here. I filmed it. He played the guitar of him using the Delta Vive and my original Univive. Mm. It's on mm. YouTube. And you can't tell the difference. Right, right. Brilliant. It. it sounds so, really good. He just started out. They're, they're quite cheap as well. I mean, most of the Univive clones you see, they're in excess of £500. Oh. His, I think it's £350. Mm. So it's uh, and that's with free shipping. So it's uh, it's not too bad, you know, and it's, it's so pedal board friendly, as you can see, it's so small. Yeah. So anyway, so, that's enough of a plug, plug for James. Yeah. It, it goes in here. Mm -hmm. comes out and it goes into this pedal here which is a prescription electronics experience pedal mm -hmm. now what this is is a fuzz an octave octave and a yeah swell does the classic jimmy octave like you hear on one rainy wish it's like a it's almost like this smooths the top off the note mm -hmm. and it's um it's a special kind of thing it's very finicky you've got to set it really well and it it kind of works and then it kind of doesn't which okay. is why I come out of this then and I go over here. This is a, a facelift pedal. So it's got a Germanium NKT275 fuzz here and another octave here. So if this isn't doing what it should. You've got that one. I'm yeah. Well with this one. Okay. Then it goes, I like fuzz before war. Okay. I like fuzz after that, but uh -huh. I like before the war. This is a... a original Vox, yeah. This is an original script, Clyde McCoy, was well, 67. So I, I use that when I can be brave enough to take it out because they've got ridiculous money now as well. Yeah, yeah. Then it comes out of the war and goes into this Jan Ray, uh, Jan Ray Vemuram, which is basically like a Fender blackface sound. Okay. I, that, that's the gain there. So I have the gain quite low on that. Then we come to the King of Tone pedal which everybody knows what they're about, really. Yeah. It's, um, I use one side as a boost, and the other side is usually set like that, actually. Uh, the other side is a drive. Then we've got the mini vent. Yeah. It's a Leslie pedal. So this one is uh, not as tweakable as um, the bigger one. I've got the bigger one as well. Uh -huh. But it's still great. You can, you can increase the speed there, and it ramps up like a Leslie. Then we have the little EP booster, which is a little solo boost thing. Yeah. Um, then this, which is a Freeman, yeah. If I don't have a, an amp with reverb, I've got reverb on this. Sorry, Mark, your iPhone's just cut off. Then, Zach. Uh, there we go. There we are. Can you yeah. see? Yeah, yeah, great. There's the flint, and then so I've got tremolo, and it's got a harmonic tremolo as well. Mm -hmm. Then we come out of that into two delays. One is set slap back. One is set longer. Right. Then we've got the tuner, and this is for using the, the dual amp setup so I can have... Like an AB switch, yeah. Yeah. So that's my, my main Turing board. Yeah. Now, as you can see, it's not, it's not small. If I put my feet there, it's not small. No, it's not, no. So I set this one up as well, uh -huh. a smaller version. So the fuzz and wow from that one will be linked to this, mm -hmm. and it will go in there out into the fuzz, into the wah, and into this, which is a BJ Harding um, Zonk machine, which is a type of tone bender. Right. Then we've got a Klon pedal. We've got this Nobles, which is the National Session Man kind of unit there. Another EP booster. You know, this is the Microvent, the smaller version of the, the Leslie there. There's the Tremolo. Then I've got... The two delays in one because I use an expression pedal so I can control the delay speed and the tuner. So that's my little board for when I'm doing support slots. It's tiny, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, nice and compact, and it, it can give you a lot of versatility as well. That's right. Yeah, that's right. But, I mean, the boutique effects have really come into their own over the last, I say, about, I don't know, about 20 years, 15 years, something like that. I mean, there's such a good range of stuff now, isn't there, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, when I first started, all I had was a tube screamer and a wah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe a, I never had a tuner. No. And then I started, then I bought a tuner and that's, that was my only 
stuff. I didn't have delays or anything like that. No. And it was a lot more straight in the amp back then. But mm. uh, now you can't get that tone anymore by tuning amps up. So you, you've got to use these little pedals, you know. Well, and, it's, uh, uh, it's um, a question I wanted to ask you was, I mean, what we've seen today is fantastic selection of gear. You've you just got some great vintage stuff there. And, I mean, you know, it's just staggering what you've got there. It's brilliant. So if you were going to go back to the, the young Mark Ponting, but nowadays, with what's available nowadays, and somebody just wanted to start out playing blues or blues rock, you know, would you give them some of a advice for maybe, you know, something like a budget amplifier or an effect that they could get going and try to get that sound? I think... Um... I think try and get a valve amplifier if you can. Mm -hmm. But saying that, there's a lot of things like the Strymon Iridium, where you can go straight into a PA. Yeah. And, uh, and that sounds, I've got one of those I use for practice, but you can use it in a PA context as well. They're really good. The digital stuff is really catching up now, the Kempers and uh, mm -hmm. the stuff like that. I mean, for a vintage, I don't think they're quite there for, for vintage sounds yet. Mm. But. Um, you can't go wrong with a, a Princeton reissue. No. They're, they're pretty good, you know. The deluxe reverb reissue is good. If you want the, the, the new Marshall stuff is better than the, the, there has been, you know. I, I don't know. I said the origin, I think it's called, or whatever mm. it was. Um, but for every thousand pounds you spend on a vintage amp, uh, on a reissue amp, you can probably pick up a, a vintage, vintage equivalent mm. that might need a little work. Just get as much as you can afford. I'd stay away from um, from transistor amps, mm -hmm. and the, the the boss stuff is good. The boss katana is good. The, mm. Like some of the line six stuff is good. There's so much choice mm. now for an up and coming. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean that's that's another thing I wanted to touch on. Which um, you, you know, you're obviously a vintage guy, and mm. you love you love your tube amps. Uh, and I, I've been asking this uh, of other musicians as well. It really sort of divide it has divided people with the modeling you know that with the kempers of fractal and line six and stuff uh i mean how do you how would you feel about it i mean is it something that you would even consider using or or have you heard some of the stuff uh that you can do um, on on some of the modelers yeah i try i tried the kemper obviously i've got the ox box yeah. here it's a kind yeah. of speaker emulation i've got a strymon iridium which is my practice home practice thing as for playing live, no, I wouldn't use it. No. It it sounds uh, like a recorded guitar. Okay. When when you, I played with um, Chris Barris' band, do you know Chris Barris? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we did some gigs with him, and he was using Kemper. Mm -hmm. And it was a pristine sound, but it was too perfect for me. There was no... Mm. The quirk in playing a valve amp yeah. is that it, it, has, it has quirks. Yeah. So, you are playing the amp as well as playing the guitar. And so would you would you kind of say that it's kind of the inf imperfections is what you're you're looking for, perhaps? It's is that... the imperfections, but the the, the it's too perfect. Hmm. And also, if you think about it, the Kempers, the way they work, they capture that amplifier on on that day with yeah. that microphone, with that speaker. Yeah. And um it's the reason they're too perfect is because it is a, it is a process duplicated sound if yeah. you if you when i'm in the studio i'll move the microphone for mm -hmm. per song you know mm -hmm. i will um, i'll change the eq sometimes for a solo during a song and then back to the rhythm or whatever just yeah. to get you know and that gives you a snapshot of that amp it doesn't give you the the full um the full thing mm -hmm. plus you know, I'm old fashioned. I mean, I'm, I'm an older guy now. I, I can't, I, I, I want a speaker cab behind me. I don't want it yeah. going up. Yeah. You want to feel the, the movement yeah. of the air and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The PA speakers, they don't sound the same as a, as a guitar speaker. Hmm. So when you're used to a Celestian style speaker and then they put you through monitors and what's coming back at you is a PA speaker. So it's a, sure. an approximation of your, of your sound. Yeah. But saying that for a younger guitar player, I think the way to go is is the digital way because you're not going to be allowed to play no that loud anymore. You know, it's uh, it's a very good point. Band, heavy rock band that's doing you know the rock circuit, 
Yeah. There's no clubs. You know, I do a lot of clubs in the UK and Europe. There's no clubs that let you play a four by twelve anymore. No. You know, it's, no. Not, not unless you 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 got a name like Joe Perry or something, and you you, you bring your own engineer. Yeah. They, you know, there's it, it's 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 unfortunate because there's something special about those sounds, but mm. they were designed for when there wasn't a decent PA system. A different so, time. Yeah. Are, decent PA systems you're better off using the little amp like that exactly make sure it's got enough headroom for you yeah you don't want something that's going to be uh you can't get a clean sound out of if you want if you want it because you can with the yeah. prince you can get a clean sound and use your pedals for, for dirt mm. you know yeah. i wouldn't go under 10 watts i would get between 10 and 20 mm. 22 watt being a deluxe reverb i go that high i wouldn't go any higher really mm. and so, until you start playing on bigger stages that's why i've got that rig there and because uh, when i'm when you're playing on a big stage at princeton you can't hear it you can't hear no, it no you're too far apart from your musicians you're too far away from the, the speaker cab you need to be able to hear it on stage and you mm. can't rely on stage monitors to do that no you've got to have some kind of back line you know yeah but there's so there's so much great gear it's, it's so much easier in my opinion now than it was Yes, it is definitely. I mean, back to the days where you and I had a H and H hundred watt amplifier because that was the only thing that was around, and they were cheap and they were loud, you know. And you you could put effects into them, and they would sound a bit different. But yeah, I mean, you're right. There's so much variety, and it's refreshing as well that you do talk about modelling. Uh, you know, even though you're a vintage guy, you do talk about there is a place for it as well. You know, and particularly for oh, yeah. new for new musicians, you know, because I think some people are really against it and. It's nice to hear, you know, your balance view on that, and particularly for yeah. younger people to hear that as well. I'm not against it. I wouldn't use it personally for anything no. other than home use. When I go in the studio, if if I'm not playing live with the band, if I'm tracking with the band, so mm. I'm laying down bass and drums, for example, yeah, I will use. I used to use a Line Six Pod, so mm. I can play, but we're not not in the room, you know. And I just use yeah. headphones. Um, now I'll probably use a Strymon Iridium for the same the same purpose. Hmm. Uh, I, so I do use a digital. I've been using it for a yeah. long time. Yeah, but not live. I couldn't use it live. No, it all has its purpose, doesn't it? I mean, it, you know, it's compact and you can get the sounds and the feel of certain things, but like you can't really get that classic valve amp that you're looking for. You know, and that that classic period as well, where everything was valve. You know, there's a, there's a certain tone. Hmm. If you're listening to the older music, there's a certain tone. That can only be achieved by using that kind of gear, yeah, you know, or definitely. a boutique clone of that kind of gear. Yeah, it's um, the other stuff will get you close, but I was I was brought up in an era where it was wasn't that far behind me that that stuff was being done. So, hmm. you know, all the records I listened to, I wanted to, to emulate that sound. You know, exactly. Yeah, I understand so, that. Yeah. Yeah. Hence the gear I got here. And like I said, 90% of these amps just get used in the studio. I don't sure. use them at all. So it's, uh, it's just years of, of um, acquiring stuff and working up to what I wanted, you know? Exactly. I had, a, I had a twin reverb reissue and I sold it and I bought that, which is a 1963 Showman. Did you see that then? Oh, no, the, the phone went off, unfortunately. Put that back on there. Yeah. Can you see that there? Yeah, now? yeah, yeah. That's a 1963 Showman. And um, once I plugged that in, I couldn't use it the reissue again. It just got it's got such Changed. a warm, clean tone to it. Yeah. It was just better. So I sold the reissue. Yeah. But I paid less for that than I did. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I think this battery is going to go flat. That's, that's okay. Well, it's it's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, just going through your brilliant collection of guitars, of effects, and amps. You know, I'm so glad that I got in touch with you and for for us to to spend this little time going through things. I mean, one thing that is left to say. I mean, uh, I would like people to to find out more about Mark Ponting Group and your music. So, you know, are, are there um, various sites and YouTube and stuff that you would like to talk about now, where and maybe people could actually buy some of the albums and uh, some of the merchandise as well. So, if if you'd like to mention some of the the stuff that they can get hold of. Yeah, well, my my website is markpontinggroup.com. And there's my last two albums are available on there. I think I think we've got some t-shirts on there as well. 
I've got a brand new album. I recorded it two years ago, but because of COVID, it's not coming out now till next year. Sure. Um, which there are some videos of songs from that album on YouTube, Mark Ponting Group on YouTube. Uh, on my Facebook band page, uh, Mark Ponting Group, go on there. Um, I've got a brand new YouTube channel, guitar related channel that I'm, I've recorded some episodes of and I'll be putting that out in the new year. It's called The Brilliant. Druid's Group. But you'll find that from uh, from Mark Ponting Group's YouTube as well. Okay. But, yeah, it's called the Druid's Cave because it was it's filmed in this little cave I've got here. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, keep an eye out for that because I'll, I'll be I'm not going to do the overproduced thing. I, it, it'll be like I'm talking to you now. It'll just be yeah. You no, know, this is this is my opinion on the first battle and uh, sure. or whatever. You know. Um. So I got that going. Plus, uh, hopefully, we'll be back out on the road. Maybe yeah. In summer. Let's hope sometime next year there'll be some more live gigs. I mean, you know, I would just say thanks so much for your time today. And if people can support local music uh, when it does come back and get out there and, and uh, support the local musicians. But also in the meantime, if they can buy some albums and T-shirts, whatever helps to support the local artists, particularly yeah. yourself. I mean, you're giving up your time for free today and a lot of other artists have done the same thing. So, I mean, any support that local artists can get and keep Cardiff Live are right behind that. But I can just say a, a really big thank you for um, spending time with us today, Mark. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure going through all, all your gear there. It's, it's, it's been amazing. Uh, and uh, look forward to chatting to you again. Good luck with a new YouTube channel as well. We'll certainly put up all the links uh, when we do this video for Gear Guru. We'll put the links on there for your stuff as well so people can connect there and, and they can check it out. But, but for now, thanks very much. And uh, hope to see you soon uh, playing live. Cheers, Mark. Thank you. So, so I'll tell your, uh, your listeners as well, a like for a like. If they like my band page, I'll like theirs. Then Brilliant. Yes, I'll have them out too. That's great. Great, great bit of advice. Okay. Thank. Cheers, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, see you again soon. Cheers.